Hello everybody, tonight we are going to be working on Unit 2 in our Advanced SharePoint class and it's a unit that I, I just posted. As I was telling the people here in the room, it covers chapters 5 through 9. And some of these tasks are things that we have done before, but as we move towards the tail end of the section of the book, you're going to see that they actually have us working on custom apps. And, and I will say that the custom apps that they're going to have us do in the book are mostly being created within the SharePoint environment because um, they really can't count on the fact that you have you know, Visual Studio and all those things or SharePoint Designer even for that matter. Uh, but ultimately the goal is where you create content external from SharePoint and then push it into the environment. Um, and what we used to do in uh, advanced SharePoint is we used to run this uh, exercise here uh, that I've included and I was uh, experimenting with it a little bit before we started to make sure that the instructions were still relatively sound and I will tell you that as we go, if I find instructions that are off or need revision, I will tell you so you can revise your own documents. Um, this document is kind of a collaboration between three different instructors. Um, and, and originally it was, I think, put together by uh, Alan Pearson uh, and Saad Youssef. And then uh, in a later iteration, uh, I taught it with Saad uh, collectively and then we started tweaking uh, the code in there and the, the instructions and it's not necessarily a difficult assignment if you've done any ASP.NET work none of that part of it is difficult it's really just to give you the flavor of creating something in Visual Studio and then instead of pushing it let's say out to an FTP server or packaging it up as a local solution running it on the local web server to actually push it into a SharePoint environment enable it as a solution and then be able to plug it into your site or sites or pages or whatever it is you're, you're attempting to do. Uh, so when it does get to work, it is nothing impressive. I'm going to tell you that right now. That's not the point. And Kornika, you'll probably remember this one because you've done it before, I assume, right? Just nod and smile. She's <laughs> nodding and smiling, sort of. Um, and that's not the point. But once you see what you can do, and then you know the other things that you can do, um, you know, in, in that ASPX, or you know, that ASP.NET environment, then you know that you could actually create some pretty robust and sophisticated things that you could push in to SharePoint if you so uh, desired. Now this does require a couple special little settings in SharePoint. So I, I want to preface all of that by, by saying that when we set up our SharePoint 2013 server, which is sharepoint.gtc.edu, we couldn't initially do this. And we put in a lot of research. It was a combination of myself, uh, a couple of the other instructors, and a student um, who actually found the solution. And it was basically a PowerShell script that allowed us to unlock the capability of not only pushing in software, but pushing in software remotely from a different machine over a network. That is not typically something that's allowed. Usually, if you have the rights to push a solution into SharePoint, you're on the same machine as the admin. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that's kind of an unusual thing. That means you're working directly on the server doing development, and you're pushing the solution right into the server. And they consider that kind of like just a safe way to do it. But the truth is, when you go and you start downloading these apps and these little plugins that they have, especially from third parties, this is how they're developed. So it can give you ideas. And, and yes, there's capability here where you could, if you created something really cool, you could put it out on the Windows Store or the SharePoint Store if they have such a thing, and other people can download it and pay you for it if you come up with something that's worthy of that. I'm not sure what that would be at this point, but it um, seems like SharePoint has most of what it needs. All right, so if you have the document open uh, in Word, um, like I said, this is one of these uh, what we call in-class labs. So it's intended to be done during class time under the supervision of your instructor. Um, and really, as far as the grading of this goes, those of you that are sitting right here in the classroom, if you get it to work, I'll come and take a look, and then I'll just give you your points, and we'll, we'll call it done. All right. So um, if you do have Visual Studio installed on your machine, please go ahead and launch it. Um, I'm using Visual Studio 2017, but I will tell you that this will work with any version of Visual Studio dating back to 2012 for sure. So 2012, 2013, 2015, or 2017 should work without any difficulty. 
Okay. You can do two things. Um, Joe, yes, you could. Well, you can do three things. That I mean, I'll install it later, but Yeah, you don't want to do it now because we'll be here all night. Forever, yeah. yeah, you could switch to a school machine. Okay. Um, the other thing you could do is you could uh, connect to the VM Horizon client and run it through the Windows. <laughs> or, <laughs> or keep in mind that you could also remote desktop into one of the VMs. Yeah, okay, all right, fine. And actually, when I was doing it earlier, that's what I originally was doing, and then I realized I could push into the machine remotely, and then I abandoned it, knowing that I could do it directly from the machine. No clue what number that is, sorry. Sorry for the phone call, but that's part of the fun of being live in the classroom. All right, <clears throat> so if you read the instructions, uh, and see, I already failed step one. What does it say here? Yeah. Now, I'm not sure really how critical this is, but you know what? It doesn't hurt to know how to do this. And why did I close the Word document? I'm not sure. Close Visual Studio if you already have it open. And then go to your Start menu and type in uh, Visual Studio. Find it, but don't click on it yet. Instead, right-click. And if you right-click it, you should see the option to run as administrator. Now, why this is important, if you were really working on the server directly, that's where this step is uh, vital. In order to be able to write files into the SharePoint environment, you have to trigger this on. Whether or not it's really necessary for what we're doing right now, my guess is it's not. It doesn't hurt to know how to do it, and it doesn't hurt to run it in this mode. But what this allows you to do is to write, write and read files to areas of your file system where you normally would not be able to do it. So. Right click, run as administrator. If you don't see that option from a right click directly, or, um, you'll probably see a, something listed that says more if you right click. Uh, there it is. Okay. And then you'll see it. And, and I'll, I'll just demonstrate that really quick. Like if you're at the regular start menu, and I don't know if any of this stuff can run as administrator, but you right click, you go to more, mm -hmm. and it usually is listed here, right? Um, and that, that could be because of the nature of the product or which version of the OS you're using, frankly. So, but Visual Studio, right click, run as administrator, and it, it will launch. And of course, it'll say, do you want to destroy your device? You're going to say yes, especially if you're working on school equipment. Now you're running as an admin. Not a big deal. If you happen to get a screen that asks you, uh, hey, your license is expired, uh, and I'm trying to see if I can even get that screen to come up, but it's usually a screen that looks like this, right? You might be asked to sign in. If you are using the community edition of Visual Studio, you need to sign in to be able to use the product. That's the price of admission. It's free, but they want to keep track, right? And to me, that seems like a pretty fair thing. So I'm, I'm logged in through my personal Microsoft account. Um, I also have a gateway one, probably the same one you use for... Um, for Office 365, you could use to log in that way too. Or if you have a personal one of any sort, or if you log into Windows or Xbox Live or anything like that using an email address, that is a Microsoft account. Doesn't matter. Could be Hotmail, Live Mail, any of those will work. Um, if, you, if it happens to say Enterprise or Professional Edition here, the licensing is different, and you'll need to get that product key from Microsoft Imagine in order to make the product active. Um, the only difference between uh, the community edition and the professional version is one is free and one is not. Um, so why on earth would you not use the community edition, really? The enterprise edition, the only real advantages to that one are advanced tools for working in team environments. So like if you work in like a big enterprise environment with a whole group of people on a project uh, where you're all pushing stuff into the same solutions, uh, you, you need enterprise. Uh, we don't do that here, so hopefully you guys are all set that way. All right, so now that we got that out of the way, I'm going to pull up this instruction set one more time, wherever it happens to be. And then I'm going to move that uh, off to the second screen. So step one, complete. <laughs> now we're going to go ahead and create a solution. And if you look at how this is worded, uh, you know, I'm going to take a little blame and put it on Alan Pearson who was the guy who was just visiting us a short while ago. 
because he has this way of writing instructions for these things uh, where sometimes it's not as clear as I think it could be. So the first instruction, or second instruction is create a solution, right? Which means make a new project. That, that, that's what he means. Um, <clears throat> because that's what you're doing when you create a new project. So go to your file menu, choose new project. Now, the back-end development language of choice these days, of course, is C-sharp for Microsoft. You could do the work in Visual Basic as well. It doesn't really matter. Um, but when you know, we're putting together ASP.NET content, um, C-sharp is really preferred now for back-end. Um, <clears throat> if you go ahead and you look uh, with the installed templates, if your machine has these installed, well, this is another caveat. When you did the installation for Visual Studio, some people go ahead and they install everything, right? Some people only install the stuff they need for class. And, and if you took any of the classes with me, the .NET classes, I tell you what stuff to install. And usually I, I have you install the Office and SharePoint stuff, the data tools, the .NET uh, frameworks, all the web development stuff. Um, and that probably covers most of it. Uh, but it's that, that Office and SharePoint category that is the part that we're really looking for. So if you go in there and expand Office and SharePoint, what we are referring to in the instructions here is to choose the add-in section. Now, I, I want you to look at this really interestingly, though, and look at the stuff that's available um, before we go ahead and make a selection. So if you just click the whole category, it's going to show you all the different... Uh, things that you can throw in and part of it frankly um, our little like traditional like web page pieces and I'm trying to find them here so like visual web parts um, you know empty projects etc but you also have the capability because office and SharePoint SharePoint are so tightly intertwined these days where you can actually build stuff for Microsoft Word and Excel and PowerPoint and any other products that are scriptable. So like uh, Jill, for example, like you do a lot of like macro stuff in Excel, mm -hmm. right? Could you imagine that if you could write your code in Visual Studio and then push it into, uh, you know, an online version of Excel, you can do that with this. You know, it takes a little bit of expertise and, and practice, obviously, but that capability exists. The category... Okay, I'm sorry. sorry no, I'm please. Because like SharePoint, you do an Excel file, that's a really good question. I think that really, you know what the answer to that is, Jill? My suspicion is that the, that the answer to that is no. Okay. But instead of writing a macro uh -huh. using like an embedded Visual Basic, right. you would write real computer code using C right. Sharp right. that would do all the processing right. and then push into Excel. Yeah, but then can you host it on SharePoint? I believe so, yeah. Okay, so I, I, I don't see why not. I didn't hear, not in the Visual Basic, but I didn't hear, and then push it to SharePoint. Yeah, th so it should. One of the big downfalls of SharePoint that if you put Excel in there, then all the networks go away. So. Right, so th yeah, that, that's why you would do this thing. Okay, okay. Now, I'm no expert on it, and I, and I haven't done that as a matter of practice, but that's my understanding. And I know that um, people that specialize in this area that actually do this kind of work can really make some good money doing it, especially, you know. And if you have stuff that's already written in VB as macros, right. converting it over to C Sharp is probably a piece of cake. Okay. So this might give you some ideas on things you can do. All right, so let's go ahead and, and um, find the right add-ins. So we're going to just choose the add-in section. And then we're going to choose SharePoint add-in with uh, C Sharp. Now I know that in the instructions um, they're choosing add-in 2015. So I guess I'm a little concerned. Then is there a 2015 version? So what I do is I, I go out here and start looking. And I, you know, I'm going to be honest. I was looking before. So um, I'm noticing that. We do have things that have dates on them, but do you notice that none of them are add-ins, right? We are still working on a SharePoint add-in. So this is the, the version that I'm selecting. I'm gonna go ahead and name this 
Um, and what you know, we instruct you to do here is to say manage CSOM and your initials. Um, whatever, whatever works for you. I'm gonna I'm gonna actually follow those instructions. Um, but if you could at least put CSOM in there in your initials, and then I, I will know. What CSOM stands for, if you're curious, um, is client side object model. That's what it stands for. All right, so once you've done that, um, it's going to you know, ask you to, like where you want to store your solution file. Now, I've been having some experiments here uh, working with Visual Studio, and I'm going to give you a disclaimer. Visual Studio 2017 does this really weird thing. It separates your solution files from your project. And you know what? I absolutely hate it because I'm completely uncomfortable with it. Just real frankly. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm sure there's a, a solid rationale for it. But what happens is, notice where it plans on storing it. It's not even in my, my documents folder from what I can tell. It's off my user directory in a source folder in repos. And that's not necessarily where your code's going to get stored. Your code's going to get stored in your documents directory mm -hmm. under Visual Studio 2017. For me, that really created kind of a logistical nightmare when I was trying to move from machine to machine. So what I've been doing with my .NET classes is I've been actually opting to put stuff on my OneDrive. And normally I would put it on my Google Drive. But here's what's been happening. The Google Drive now um, is Google Drive file stream, right? So it's not like a memory or, or a local folder on my machine anymore. It's a cloud drive that reads as a drive letter. So it doesn't play well with Visual Studio. So I've been using OneDrive because it still has a physical folder on my machine. And then I'm going to actually make a new folder here um, and call it um, SP ADV so I know where my stuff is. And yeah, I was put a couple underscores in front so it pops up to the top. That's just a goofy thing I do. That's what we call old school. <laughs> but that's where I'm putting my stuff. So my solution file and my project will end up in that location now. And then I'm going to go ahead and uh, say OK. Now, something weird is going to happen here on the next screen, which is not typical for things that you've been doing before. If you happen to be working directly on the server, which is really kind of the intent of this, you would put into the URL at this point the same thing you would put into the URL as if you were working on the machine. So if we were on one of our VMs, for example, we would put uh, HTTP uh, SP-Dev because that's what it's known as locally. Right? And you guys remember that sort of-ish? Okay. Maybe not. But since we actually have a real live SharePoint server that we can hit, we can put in the URL for sharepoint.gtc.edu. And then remember that I told you that we set it up so that we can push solutions in remotely, which normally would not be allowed. OK? So the other thing that you want to make sure that uh, you notice here are these check boxes at the bottom. So notice that if you happen to have admin access to a cloud-based, a provider-based uh, SharePoint host, right, whether it's Microsoft or some private company, because there are private companies that do it too, you check the first box, which is what they assume and really what they prefer. But because we are running it ourselves, we choose the second option. Okay, and then we'll go ahead and click Next. All right. You will, of course, be prompted to log in. So, Let's yep. And you may, and, and you might not need to, but you may need to use your fully qualified machine name to log in. Is, is the login the password thing on last week? Is the VLOOP on or is it the VLOOP No, it is. You, you would all be first initial, last name. I set mine up for, so it's just Ty, but you, you'll all be first initial, last name. So I would just start with that. Your first initial, last name, 
and then whatever you set as your password or I assigned as a password. And then of course we click OK and pray. What were the, uh, for the password, what were the, what were the special rules again? You said you had to have something? Uh, one upper, one number, one special character as a minimum. The fact that we got this far, did you guys all get this far? Yes. That's a huge thing. Because <laughs> I remember the first time I tried this and it wasn't working before we enabled those scripts. Uh, you know, we were like, ah! you know, like pretty much crying because <laughs> we couldn't get it to work. Um, we are working with SharePoint 2013 and I want you to notice here what the question is. What's the earliest version of SharePoint that you want your add-in to target? And so, you know, and these really are the versions. It's 2013, 2016, and technically 2019, uh, even though they don't call it that anymore. Now it's just like online, which means continuously updated. I'm gonna choose 2013 because the server we're pushing it to is guess what, 2013. All right, and that means it'll also work for the other versions as well. But there are some behind the scenes uh, things that happen in the background uh, like certain DLL files and, and libraries that are necessary for it to work on different platforms. So that, that, that's the why. Go ahead and click Finish. And if we pray hard enough here. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. What's the difference between the regular .NET and the MVC? Regular .NET uh, uses ASP style tags okay. and you know special you know if you remember them from the class or not um, and then MVC um, uses a different approach where you're using a different presentation language so you're not using ASP tags you can still use them mm -hmm. but you're using um, a language called Razor as a presentation language intermingled with traditional HTML CSS and JavaScript um, and then uh, the documents are broken down into pieces. So we do a separation of the data abstraction. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, components that generate the views that you see, and then we have components that um, kind of direct traffic and run the logic. Um, so its models are the data, views are what you see, and controllers are the ones that direct traffic uh, with other tools and they all kind of work together. And the, the whole point of it, Jill, is a separation of concerns. Okay. So instead of writing like one big web page, yeah. like what you learned in regular .NET is that you write pages where you like, can have a master page, right. and then when you create a new page, you're using that master page for the structure, and then right. you're just injecting content into it. Kind of the same approach in MVC, but it's not done with a master page. Although you can use a master page, so it gets like kind of weird. So it's really kind of a different architecture, but it's really the more modern approach. The most applications are built using MVC these days, okay. because what it allows you to do is to do things in little pieces, and it allows multiple people to work on the project simultaneously as well. And there, and that way, you can get one person that makes the site look nice, mm -hmm. and another person that makes it work. You know, so you get those kind of like combination of skills. All right, so those of you that have done this work before will recognize the traditional components of an ASP page. And I, I want you to notice a couple different things here. Uh, first of all, you know, the stuff that we're working with, this is our, basically our home page, right? The default page. And notice that it has a couple like things in here if you're used to regular ASP and notice it says it inherits Microsoft SharePoint web part pages web part page right um, we didn't put that in right but with the template that we chose will do that in in terms of where the master page actually is there actually is a, a master page but that actually exists on the server that you're pushing it to right so instead of like pushing it to a master page that's here in this project, you're pushing it into whatever framework uh, SharePoint runs, which also tells you the technology that's, that's behind SharePoint. Folks, it is ASP.NET, right? Uh -huh. In all its glory. Um, 
both the ASPX pages, um, the MVC approaches, all those things are kind of combined all together in that environment. So, yeah. right. So, um, it, it, it is, and it, it gets pretty intense pretty quickly. But remember, the goal of a lot of these tools is that things are automated, so you really don't have to do a lot of nitty gritty code yourself. And there's a lot of plug and play components that you can throw in as well. All right, let's move on um, at this point. So we, and notice like step number six says, this can take as much as a minute to validate, and it, it happened almost immediately, right? Um, because we're sitting in the same building with the server, and uh, we're not running on like some you know memory strapped VM with a fraction of CPU. Um, all right, so now that we are in this environment, we need to actually take a really quick look at our server explorer. So in the solution explorer window, you'll see these tabs at the bottom. The default is that you look at your project structure, right? So it's kind of like files and folders, and I'm gonna say sort of, it's really more um, a resource explorer, you know, is the way I kind of look at it. But there is a tab for server, and you're gonna notice that there's a section for Azure, right? Yeah, and it's trying to connect me to Azure right now and my Azure account is not active. Uh, you'll also notice uh, other servers that you might connect to. So these could be database servers, web servers, whatever. But you notice that we do have a SharePoint uh, section. And notice I'm getting this like weird message. All right, so I click on it and you guys can try it. And I just got a message that said, uh, SharePoint's not on this machine, dude, what are you doing? All right. Did you notice what the instructions say? If no connection exists, you need to add a connection. Okay? So the way you can do that is you can right click the SharePoint node and click add connection. And here's where we're actually gonna find out uh, if this is gonna work or not. And if it doesn't work here, we're still going to go through with doing the steps of the exercise um, and then try to move it to the correct environment, okay? Notice what it's saying. It says, the required version of SharePoint Foundation or SharePoint Server is not installed on this system, so it thinks it cannot make the connection. I'm going to try it one more time because I thought we made the connection. Okay. That makes for... Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so since we can't connect locally, we're going to try to establish a server connection this way. So click this little icon up here that says connect to server, and then type in sharepoint.gtc.edu, and pray. All right. Let's try it with an HTTP in front. And notice, different message this time. So this is actually not necessarily a bad thing, but notice what it says, invalid username or password. Mm -hmm. That tells me it's talking to it, right? Right. So that means something's happening. Um, now, the question is, how do we connect with a different username? Well, there's see this link right here? So let's try that link. All right, and let's try to put in our usernames and passwords and pray, pray, pray. <laughs> I hate to say that, but sometimes when I do SharePoint, that's how I feel. All right. Didn't seem to fight me at all. Now I'm going to say okay. And SharePoint is now on my list. Okay. So I'll tell you what. The first time I did that action, I probably did try doing that for like three hours straight before I figured out that link, that silly little link that looked grayed out. Yeah. yeah. But it's like Microsoft is saying, yeah, this is great. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not intuitive. No, it's not intuitive at all. Um, all right. Are you guys able to get that part going? How do we know that, that that's our server? Does it give the domain name of the server there? We just have those lists there. Yeah, that's it's really, it's... Um, 
That's a wonderful connection. Next, I mean, question. <laughs> Next, <laughs> it really, you know, it really is. I, I'm, I'm thinking. But that's a, that's a really um, an excellent uh, point. But notice, you know, hypothetically, we are able to see look the event, the event logs, the message queues, services, and now whether or not this will allow us to push the work in, we're going to discover. We're still going to proceed with the assignment, okay? For better or for worse. All right. So now that we got past the first section of the the document. Uh, we're going to start to work on the actual page. So switch back to your Solution Explorer. So if your tabs are listed like mine. And, and what we were saying before is sometimes the Server Explorer is sometimes like found over here on the sidebar, right, which is kind of weird. And if you don't see it anywhere, just come up to View and find this, the, the windows that you need. So um, right now we're going back to Solution Explorer, but we were basically working with Solution Explorer and Server Explorer. Okay, so now that we got that going, uh, we're going to open up our default uh, .aspx page. And that's the page that comes up automatically after you create this. So that's the page we're looking at right now. All right. So what we're going to do is we are going to actually create a new page. So I'm going to go to the Pages folder, right-click, choose add and then choose new item all right so you're gonna get this list that that pops up and notice now that we have a project going with predefined parameters the the template list on the left is really narrowed down significantly because there's only certain things that will work with this type of project. So that, that's why it's a little more concise. Uh, what we're looking to add is a page. And it should be uh, in the Office and SharePoint section. Uh, but you know, honestly, it could be in a number of different sections, honestly. And if you don't find it right away, you can always search. And they want us to call this page, page two. Yeah, we're just, yeah, it's just a page. Yeah. Why? Just because. I didn't write those instructions. Alan did, so <laughs> we're going with it. But this is basically an ASPX page. Um, all right, so we're going to go ahead and click Add. And then it creates a new page. Now, it has a whole bunch of, like, stuff at the top that, you know, pretty much you don't want to touch any of these directives up here because those are done automatically. So not something you worry about. But what we need to do next is we need to actually add some content to the content area and that's going to be right in here. So find the content placeholder that's placeholder main. That's the main body of the page. You guys remember that? Anything that gets dumped up here ends up in the head section of the HTML document. Anything that's dumped here, uh, it goes into the body section of the document. So like, for example, if I wanted to add a link to like a custom like CSS file, I would put it up here. Or if I wanted to throw a script in, right? Like something you would throw into the head section of your document. Anything that you would add to the regular content of the page would go down here. What they want us uh, to do, or what they're asking us to do, is just put in something so we know what page we're on. And what we did in the past is we would just create a header and just say, uh, this is the second page of the managed CSOM app. Yes, it's just straight HTML. And then we also put in an H2 that said, this is a SharePoint hosted app. Okay, that's all they're asking us to do. Uh, at this point, I'm doing a control S to save. And then our next instruction, which for some reason is ungodly large and bold, 
says we can add a simple ASP.NET to our app. This seems like to make no sense. This page will end up being uh, standard HTML. All right, so that's page two. They want us now to return to the default page and go way down to the bottom, right below the closing content tag. And what they want us to do is they want us to add an anchor tag that will take us back to that other page. So um, while they're in the same folder, I can see in my Solution Explorer, so all I have to do is call it by name. Of course, you can use the, the URL picker there too, if you wish. Close the tag and maybe call the link page two. Right? Simple enough. Save it. And then at this point, they're saying, uh, he says, save and build the app. Well, I did the save. How do I build? You guys ever done that? All you have to do is go to the, the root of your project. That This is the way I do it, okay? There is a menu, actually, that says build. What the heck is build? So when you run your app, usually we, we hit the play button, and we don't really think about it, right? And as long as there's no underlines, like red underlines, it goes through, and it compiles your code. That's the build, right? Yeah, but we're not going to click start here because it's not going to launch. Necessary. Well, actually, that's not true. It will launch, but it won't be at all what you expect. But we can actually right-click the root of the project here and just click build. All that does is it compiles the code. Now, you've got to remember, when you're doing ASPX applications, the way that they're significantly different from traditional HTML is they're compilable because we have back-end code. And that's also one of the advantages of it is because we compile it into an executable. That, you know, so anything that's like C-sharp can do a combination of running on the fly, but when it gets built into that, that binary file and it's loaded up onto the server as an application, it operates that much faster because it's pre-compiled code. It's not interpreting the code on the fly. It's already, that's already done. It just runs. So one of the reasons why people like working in this environment is really because of that. Because if you are working with a traditional web environment, let's say PHP, that's interpreted code, right? Mm -hmm. The server is still running it, but it runs it when it's called. And every time it runs it, so every time like you read and write to the database, it's pulling up the code and running, as opposed to it like being a pre-built binary that will run all that much faster. It saves a step in the process. So interesting, uh, at the very least. All right, so now uh, we're going to go ahead and try the next little section here. And actually, let me show you where I'm at in the document. This is where I'm at right now. So we just uh, finished this. And it says close page two. I didn't do that, whatever. Uh, but we're going to start on this. But let's let's take a break because we're a good hour in already. Uh, and I promise that we'll do a, a five-minute break every hour. So um, here we go. Mind? So we're back from break, and we're going to move on now. And we're working on the section entitled Client Web Parts. And uh, the first instruction there is to add a new web part by right-clicking on the Pages folder. I'm going to add new item. And then we're going to select Client Web Part. So we, we already were talking about this before I hit Record. But make sure you're in the uh, uh, Office SharePoint category, and you should find it pretty quickly. Um, and what they want this one to be called is CRUD, C-R-U-D. Once you have the name uh, typed in, go ahead and click Add. And you're going to get the secondary uh, screen, all right? And it says create a new add-in web page for the client web part content, the page name uh, we already put in. And we are going to go ahead and click uh, Finish. All right. 
So this makes another new ASPX page. And we're going to be looking for uh, a little spot in here that's right here on mine. It's on line six, probably the same with you guys. And it says highlight from this line to the end of the file. Include, um, I'm trying to read the instructions and make sense of them. It says include above the line and convert them into a comment. Oh, I see what they're saying. Okay. So they, they want us to basically blow away all this HTML uh, content. And you guys know how to do a comment in, in uh, .NET, right? Basically, um, you can right click, well, I, apparently not anymore. Uh, so maybe you gotta do it from, from uh, the menu. So highlight your code and then you can format um, the selection here. And I think, they, okay, so they moved it to the advanced tab here in the edit menu, so you can comment the selection. So including line six, right? With pages? Right. From line six on down. Now notice that the comments that we're using here aren't HTML content comments, they're ASPX comments, so it's the percent dash dash, and then to escape it, you just do um, dash dash percent bracket to get out. And you know, one of the points here is we want to leave this in place because we're going to copy some of the code. All right. Now it says uh, replace the highlighted code with the code that's provided in the document. Now you can actually copy and paste directly from Word, but I, I caution you on this mostly because sometimes the double quotes from Word moving over can uh, come in as those smart quotes. So just do a control C and what the instructions say is to replace that code, but since it's commented out, I don't really see the point of it. So I'm actually going to drop mine in right here and paste. Uh, and then what you're going to see is we're putting in a new content section and it's got a bunch of uh, scripts that tie us into the jQuery libraries, the Ajax libraries, um, and a bunch of SharePoint uh, tools. Those are the ones that are, have a little sp.js in there. And there you go. Now, the thing that's important here, though, is you notice how jQuery has a specific version number here. You have to make sure that in your scripts folder that you're running the same version of jQuery. Now, I'm noticing that it happens to be the same right now. So this tool, because of the version of SharePoint that we chose when we're building, uh, automatically put in the right version. But in, in past iterations, we have had issues where they didn't match up. And, and of course, it would highlight and underline if it wasn't there. The other thing I want you to notice is this library here with a dot dot slash in front of it, right? That's a local file. Notice that these that have this preface here, you guys will recognize that these are SharePoint folders. So they're actually from the SharePoint. Um, you're not going to find these necessarily directly in our project. So is this code that that guy just came up with? What, what is the? Um, so that was in the Word document that you cut and pasted. In. Yeah, this was in the Word document, going from page two to three. Uh, we copied it from a different project, <laughs> if you want to know. We copied it from uh, some code that came with one of the books that we used to use. All right, so that jQuery thing is probably the biggest problem that you'll have uh, here. So I'm just looking ahead there. All right. Um, 
Now, the next little uh, instruction here says, notice the display div tag is one we will use to change what is displayed. Okay, so the next instruction then, step 23, add the following to the page directive at the top of the CRUD ASPX file. This should be right after the language. Okay, so here's the language, right? And then we want to insert master page file. And let me explain what's happening here. You know, you guys have done master pages before, so it's not like a new concept. But that is usually a directive that happens in the first line of the ASP uh, code that's dropped in. And what we're really doing here is we're actually pointing to the master uh, page file, the default master, for the SharePoint installation or for whatever your, your site is that you're working on. So it'll inherit from the site that's running inside of SharePoint as opposed to like one that you may have built or was pre-generated for you. Okay, so you guys good with that? Yes, Mr. Kinnis. So you're... So did you just add something to it then? You had to add that master page. Yep. Yeah, that one from step number 23. And I added it to the first ASP declaration at the top. And if you remember back to your .NET class, that declaration is present in all your .NET files. You don't usually see the SharePoint stuff in there, but you do see the language, the page file, and any other components that we put in. Say that again, Cornica. Did you find it? All right, so if you got that in place, let's move on to step number 24. Um, all right, so I'm gonna, at this point, I'm doing a control S to save, just so I don't lose any of my work. And then for step number 24, it says we turn to the default ASPX file which I have here, and add a link to CRUD ASPX. And where are you going to put that? Well, you can put that right here at the bottom. In fact, if you want, you could, uh, you can throw in a line break, and then just to add another link so they're not like right on top of each other. And we know what the file is called. It's in the same directory. There's no real reason to... Uh, And let's just say crud. Just a way to be able to link. All right. After you've done that step, step number uh, 25, they want us to add some stuff in the scripts folder. So I'm going to right click the scripts folder and then choose to add a new item. All right. And now we want to add a JavaScript file. So JavaScript file templates are located under the web area. And if you don't see it, well, there it is. So just choose to add a new JavaScript file. And we're going to call this crud.js. And that's going to be in the scripts folder. All right, now they're going to give us uh, some code. So we'll go ahead and click Add. Have the file get created. And then you'll see that it does appear uh, in the scripts folder. And now they would like us to add some code. All right, the first thing they want us to do uh, is to create a namespace. So, so we're doing this one piece at a time here, so make sure you follow the steps. So Control-V. Uh, we're going to set up a namespace. And, and if you guys aren't familiar, what, what is a namespace? Uh, uh, <coughs> name of the server, kind of, or Windows domain name, kind of, is that, is that what you're using? 
Well, um, you know what, Bill? It does have to do with naming things. And really what it is, is a container for encapsulating things with the purpose of giving them names that are unique so that you don't overlap with other things that might happen to be named the same thing. That's really what a namespace is. It's just, it's just an encapsulating bit of code. Right, so we're just following the, the instructions one by one. That was step number 29. And, and notice you know, the, the syntax here says window.gateway equals window.gateway or hmm, an empty code block. Right? That, that's just the terminology they use to create a namespace. Um, then we're going to create um, an object for contacts. So gateway is kind of the name. So we're going to say gateway dot contacts. Then we're going to move to step number 31 where we're going to actually create uh, a list under that namespace. We're going to say gateway dot contact list equals a function. Notice uh, this is an anonymous function. It's not named. Uh, really what we're doing is we're naming it by virtue of assigning it to a variable construct. Um, and then at the end of it, because of the way that this works, is we're going to put um, a parameter uh, section there. I guess I don't know what you call that. Um, but that's how we create it. And notice right now it is um, empty. All right. So now everything else that we're going to add here from step 33 on, or some of this stuff, is going to end up going directly inside of this function. So this does span um, pages here. I'm going to see if I can select it across pages and then just paste it in. And this this is going to go in pieces, so you will get some underlines here because stuff uh, is incomplete as we move. Um, this is step 33. We're also going to add a success method here. And I want you to keep in mind here, we're working in, in, in JavaScript, you guys, right? And one thing that you can do in JavaScript, um, you can actually do a function, like declare a function and say function, give it a name, like, so for example, I mean, just, just to clarify what I'm trying to point out here, is I could just do this, right? In JavaScript, I can just declare a function like this, right? But one of the modern approaches that people do is because in JavaScript, you can put anything inside of a variable. We just give something a name and assign it to an anonymous function and then when we want to trigger that, we just use one word, and we don't even worry about the parentheses, especially if we're not passing anything in. And that allows us to do some kind of interesting and sophisticated things uh, as a result. All right, so we're going to be reading in uh, a bunch of stuff. Next thing we're going to do is add the read all method. This is step number 35. And I forget who wrote this code or who brought all this code in, but I, I think Saad brought it in from one of his other exercises that he does. And the point isn't really to write this code. 
But if you were working on a real project, you might have to worry about it a little bit because you would, you know, write the logic to get the task done. In this case, it's provided for us. And then we're going to do a callback. And this is where we do a little bit of JavaScript again to help generate HTML content. And then you're also going to notice how we're going to drop in some, some jQuery here as well. All right, so this is from step 36. And once again, we're still using that same approach where we have objects that are that are named and um, they're really just taking anonymous functions and pumping them into those named variables. The, the goal of this last thing here, of course, is to actually structure the content into an HTML container. And so they basically set up a loop where we put in the initial part of the table and then uh, we begin taking all the individual entries that are in the contact list and putting them into columns. And notice it's loop. And what's going to happen here is you're making a contact list that's going to be um, a thing where it's going to operate inside the browser. And you can add a value to it. And it will add itself to the list and display on the page. Now, I know that sounds pretty simple. And that's not, the point isn't to know what this code is doing, but to take something that is some sort of a coded solution, in this case it's done in JavaScript, and to be able to push that into SharePoint and have it operate. That, that's our goal. We also need to have some sort of a, a error handling uh, component here, so we do create an error function, so we can display uh, error messages to the user. Notice the use of jQuery, right? Every time you see this, folks, right, you guys are familiar with jQuery, I'm assuming, right? Whenever you see the dollar sign in JavaScript, you know you're working with jQuery. What follows the dollar sign typically will be a CSS style selector. All right. Uh, step number 38, we're going to add uh, what we're calling the public interface here. So we're going to grab the code from step 38 and drop it in. And I think I'm noticing a typo here. Are you guys catching this? Um, I'm getting a little green underline right there. And I'm not sure if that's necessarily right or wrong. Um, here it says missing semicolon. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that it's actually a missing Hmm. I did not get it. You did not get it. So what did you do right that we did wrong? Well, I, I, don't, have, I don't have that, but I have, I have a, I have a down here. I have a little underline. Now it's gone. I don't have that either. You know what? I'm not in the, in the panic mode with this yet. I think I'm going to press ahead and, and paste in the last section of code and then try to figure out how to close it. All right. Yeah, 39 is the last bit of code that we're dropping in. So I'm going to, uh, and this is the document ready function. All right. So I have a thought here. Yeah, and you know what? That's kind of how weird this stuff is because that, that's what happens sometimes. Yeah, and my, my thought is... All right, now I have the, also the opportunity where I can go ba back and look at a solved version of this, and that, that clearly isn't going to work here. So I'm going to Control-Z that, 
and I'm going to look at the structure of what I got going here. I got my namespace, contact list, function, got a read all function, and see how these are all comma separated. And then we get, you know, my my feeling is that we need a, just need a comma there. Right? What is the kind of view again? It's outside of the... Yeah, well, okay. That, okay, what that does, Bill, is because we're working with uh, these JavaScript code, code blocks, really what we're doing is we're separating the, the code blocks, and really we're establishing key value pairs. So really, we're serializing JSON data, and so we're, we're creating... Um, kind of like an objects with JavaScript without formally creating objects. You do. Yeah. So. But I didn't get any of that You know what? I'm just gonna do a save. Well, now I'm getting a red squiggle by the R, and it says encountered a parsing error, and it says missing semicolon. You know, my feeling is, is this is where I'm missing the semicolon. That's just my feeling on it. But the fact that this parameter is at the very end. All right, let me see. We can just pause. Just to review that really quick, to finish up the error function, we decided to put a semicolon here and a semicolon after the return statement, uh, and then the document ready function after the closing of the contact list. Which don't you have? I don't have the semicolon that I don't have the error, so it looks like it's okay. Let me, Bill, can I? All right, so I, I did end up, and I'm, I'm recording this in, is I did end up removing the semicolons here, even though it's expecting it. Everybody else seems to be able to get it in without the underlines. These are green underlines, not red underlines, so they're not necessarily critical. You can see the, the left sidebar is all green, meaning really syntactically it's maybe correct. And I don't know if maybe uh, that's throwing it off. That could be too, but it shouldn't be. Uh, so we're just going to say that's okay and save it. <laughs> All right, now we're going to go ahead and add a list called contacts into the mix. So now we're going to go to the project node, which is the, the bolded name at the top of the Solution Explorer, not the very top one, but the second one. And now we're going to choose uh, SharePoint. I mean, <laughs> thank you, Microsoft. Uh, but in the Office SharePoint section, notice that you can pull you can pull in a list, right? And if you look at the description, it says a SharePoint list item for specifying a custom list of fields or creating a new list from an existing list, such as the document library. So now we're actually creating SharePoint stuff outside the environment. It's kind of interesting when you start to think about it that way. Uh, what do they want us to call it? Um, do you guys see a name? Yeah, now I'm not seeing that they're asking. Is that what you're calling it? Oh, add a, oh, yeah, sure does, right at the beginning. Add a list called contacts. Thank you, Jill. <laughs> contacts and add. And here's where you select the template. Um, so based on an existing uh, template, contact. And, and basically what that is, and if you click that drop down again, these are all the list types that you have available inside of SharePoint. 
So that's kind of cool that you can build it outside the environment. Um, so once you've selected that, it says important. Prior to the next step, click on the project node in Solution Explorer. Go to the properties, look for site. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. All right. So that's the, okay. There's no instruction here that says click finish, but I assume we're clicking finish. <laughs> Is that a good guess? And that's probably something I should add to the template here. And I'm going to save it in there. All right. Now it says, once again, step 43. Prior to the next step, click on the project node in Solution Explorer here. Go to the properties window and look for the site URL entry. And believe it or not, I think that we're already looking at it, but perhaps not. Actually, I think we were already looking at it. Yeah. Right. Site URL, and this is site relative URL, and All right, so I'm looking at this really carefully, and I'm, I'm not really comfortable with this step, I'll tell you, because of the way, it, I'm gonna click on the properties uh, again, and what I'm looking for here is, I, I am gonna go through these, uh, these setting windows here, because I just have this terrible feeling <laughs> that I've done this before, you know what I mean? Um, we know it's not gonna be there, but you know, I, I have this like, thing inside me that says, but you better, you better check all this, right? So that's what I'm doing, right? When in doubt. All right, and I figured if it's not on this tab, then it's probably not there at all. All right, so we were in the right place, apparently. All right. So now they want us to hard code this URL in so now we're. This context has got to be that HTTP in blue, right? Step 43, is that what it's saying? The site URL is the URL that says this context, so it's got to be the HTTP one? Yep. Because otherwise it's going to be relative to the project. And what we're trying to do, Bill, is push it in onto the server directly into a specified location. Alright, so I'm just copying the URL that we have provided there. Yeah, and I'm, you know what, I'm going to control Z this, because I still think that I'm putting it in the wrong spot. So I'm going to the, to here. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, there it is. So you, you put down the, uh, the other, the little icon. Right? So I got here. Yeah. The properties window automatically shows up. Right. And then I just scroll down. Yep, I see it now. Yep, there it is. It's and the on. site URL. Okay. So there's nothing wrong with the instructions. But we are going to append here, we're going to say sites slash developer, and hopefully this is valid. You know, because I, I, you know, over time, sometimes this stuff becomes invalid. Developer. Oh, slash. And then press enter to lock it in. All right, now, I, now I'm seeing it says the property value is not valid must be set to your URL with an HTTP or an HTTPS key. Okay, so did I, do we not have that here?
Okay. So now it did like pop up a message. And, and I'm, what I'm trying to do is show you the, what popped up in the background before the login popped in. So we have to type our information in here again? Yeah, so it says the site URL property of the file was modified with blah, 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 to ensure designers would close all files that are open in the designer and then open them again. All right, I'm not worried about that box because right now it's asking me to log in, right? So I'm going to go ahead and log in with the stuff I have. Now here's, here's a part, if, just fair warning. If you're, we, we know that we all set ourselves for admins, right? Mm -hmm. So we should be okay. But if you were in an environment where you, where you, your user is not an admin, this is one of the reasons why often, you know, it's all about working on the server and, you know, that whole scenario. Um, I'm going to go ahead and type in my magic password here. Mm -hmm. And, all right. I got that too, but it works. Right. All right. And, it, and it did keep. Now we're going to go ahead, step number 44. And we already, you know, it says you might be prompted to log in, but now we're going to build. Okay, we're going to build the app. And if that already built, <laughs> I think that, that's probably a good sign because I, I didn't get any. I got successful. Build one, succeeded, zero failed. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to like build it again because it just happened too fast. I didn't feel comfortable with it. Yeah. And notice, you know, one thing I'm not seeing, it says in step 44 that in the console you should see a series of messages saying installing, which is a good sign. And if you're not logged in, you'll be prompted. Okay, so. Well, here's the thought, right? We built this app. We're connected to the SharePoint server. So this pushed out to the server. But that, wouldn't that, yeah, it pushed out to the server, but okay, so to authenticate or validate that, we should check the server. We have to log in. Yeah, log okay. in. Yeah, the browser, the browser. Right. But I don't see mine, but I see somebody else's. JSM. Okay. Who the heck would that be? I'm trying to remember the initials, you know, because it's been a while. Is it the foundation, is it? Uh, I'm going to give this a try. I'm going to go to the server now um, through the browser, right? So I'm going to bring up a browser tab here and move it over. I have not logged into SharePoint through a browser all day or all session. So let's go ahead and connect to the server. I'm going to go ahead and sign in. And I am now signed in. Yeah. yeah, and then what I'm going to do but is yeah, we know that it went to sites slash developer. All right. Okay, so you see where we landed, right? Okay, now now notice I see my I see my old one here, but do you guys noticing that there's pages of these things? Do you notice how they're sorted? Ascending by date. I'm gonna resort uh, descending. So the newest ones are up on top. Now okay, now here's the sad part about all this. I'm still not seeing <laughs> all right. Um, but here, here's kind of what's neat about this. Um, I, we do have ones here that pre-exist. So the, the worst case scenario is we're going to look at an old example of what works, okay? Um, all 
All right, so what we might have to do is we might actually, and I'm looking at this message at the top. And here's um, my thinking here. So I'm gonna click on apps and testing. And I'm still seeing nothing but old files here. Because I still called it manage CSOM, but I did dash TK on mine. All right, so I'm, I'm doing it very frankly. Um, I'm looking. So like ones that I see here are ones that have not been deployed yet. All right, if the app is stored on a local machine, then upload it to the developer site. Now, I'm assuming that happened through the interface, but you know, it looks like it didn't, okay? So another uh, possibility here is maybe we can push it from Visual Studio directly in, but what I'd like to show you first is what's supposed to happen, okay? So let's just go <coughs> back here and I'm gonna find one of my old ones. So you see this one right here? I'm going to go ahead and click on that. Oh, great. I'm trying to get with all of them. All, so you tried a bunch of them? Yeah. Jill? Yep. Okay. Okay, so here's what, here's what I'm going to try. With the work that I have done here, I'm going to try an experiment because I because I can. Okay, I'm going <laughs> to because I'm an admin. <laughs> yeah, because I can. Because I'm on the server. I'm an admin on the server. I'm going to go to my OneDrive through the server, pull the project in, and push it from the server itself into into SharePoint and see what happens. Okay, so I'm going to close my project here. And I think I know the step that we're missing here, too. Okay. Now that I close Visual Studio, now it dawns on me like, like a lightning bolt. Right? Okay. I'm opening, you know, and I'm recording all of this. So this is going to be a great video. Mm -hmm. I'm going to popcorn for this one. It's an hour and a half feature. <laughs> all right. We're going to go ahead and open up our um, project that we've been working on. We're being patient because it's stored in the cloud drive. Yeah, and and I and I'm you know and I see that's it, funny because like when you're you're following the directions you know and it's been a while since I've done this, folks, probably a good year and a half, and you know it doesn't click. You know, right away. So, and I, and I apologize for that. But um, remember, they remember they told us right that we want to build and run the app. But we did do the build, right? And okay, so it's asking me to connect. So I'm going to connect. All right. I want to make sure that that URL is right. It, it is server connection um, is online. You know, the part that I didn't do, right, is I did, I, I, I did do a right click and build, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll do that again, not a big deal, right? And hopefully, taking a little longer this time, but it did work. But I never hit the start button. How do you run the app? Start. start. Now hopefully, this will do a build again, right? But notice, install SharePoint add-in, uploading the SharePoint add-in. Add-in failed. Okay, I shouldn't have read that part. 
There were deployment errors. Continue, I'm gonna say yes. Uh, but I wanna be able to look at the, at the log file here. So it is, I'll notice it, it's pushing me right to the environment. You guys seeing this? I didn't launch this tab, it just put me there. But what I do wanna um, look at here is the output because at some point okay install SharePoint add-in uploading installation in progress add-in failed to install cleaning up successfully uninstalled add-in add-in installation encountered the following errors and then it tells us apps disabled oh check it out apps are disabled on this site apps cannot be installed review the diagnostic logs for more details all right, so this is part of the fun of SharePoint, but now what does that tell us? It, tell, it tells us something specific that we can actually um, hopefully enable the feature to allow that to happen. So here's my proposition for you. Let's take a break because, yeah, that's how much time we've put in already. Um, and when we come back, I'm going to see if I can enable that feature and we can push it in. If it doesn't happen to work, you know, and I'm not going to get really super frustrated about this because just seeing the process mm -hmm. is just as important, frankly. Um, I can show you an older wor working version of what is intended. If I can get the feature turned on, wonderful, and then you guys can all push something in there. And you know what, it doesn't have to be anything even as sophisticated as this. We could write something super silly mm -hmm. that you've already created, any sort of JavaScript or whatever, and push it into the environment enable it as an app and get it to run and you got the flavor of what what's going on that's and that's the key so let's do uh, a five minute break folks stand up walk around go to the bathroom and all so i'm going to wrap up this video by saying that we experimented a little bit with our uh, sharepoint server configuration uh, there seems to be something wrong with the configuration that's preventing things from running that's why i'm showing the screen here um, we have done this successfully in the past and even trying to deploy it directly from the server, uh, it was blocked. So I need to do a little bit of investigation and see if there's a, some tweaks I can make to make it work again. I'm sure there is, it, it's fixable because uh, I know it was working at one point. But this video ends here. And even if you don't get it to work, going through the process of it really is just as useful as um, being successful.